Welcome everyone to another episode of In a Nutshell, the fortnightly podcast hosted by Natural Gas World, where we look at the global news and trends in the gas industry. My name is Joseph Murphy, and today we are discussing emerging US energy policies in oil and gas. US President Joe Biden has taken a starkly different stance to the industry compared with his predecessor. Here to discuss with me in detail what the Biden administration will mean for the US oil and gas industry is Mark Finley. Mark is a fellow in energy and global oil at Rice University's Baker Institute with over 35 years of experience working at the intersections of energy, economics, and public policy. Before joining the Baker Institute, he led production of a BP Statistical Review of World Energy. Good to have you with us, Mark. Thanks for the invitation, Joseph. Or do you prefer Joe? Let's go with Joe. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so so um, the Biden administration is into its... Um, first few months now. Uh, so we've seen quite a few headlines of uh, concerning what this administration means for oil and gas. Uh, but perhaps you could give us a quick uh, refresher on what the president has said and done so far, and how he contrasts with his predecessor. Um, also, are there any aspects of his policy that might have overlooked the mainstream media? Um, well, I think it's important to, to at the first uh, glance, to separate Campaign rhetoric from the you know, the reality of governing um, sure. and, uh, and and the complexity of it. Uh, what we've seen so far are some only some early indications. It's very early days, and you know things will play out in a fashion that is very unpredictable. But we've gotten kind of a a peek inside the tent, if you will, you know, with the uh, early executive orders that uh, the president uh, promulgated. You know, things like rejoining Paris um, and also putting a uh, moratorium, uh, you know, a temporary pause on issuing of uh, new leases and permits on federal lands. Uh, so there are um, some, some of these measures, well, all of those measures were anticipated. I think there was, um, you know, the president had telegraphed his views and intentions during the campaign. And so, no one should have been surprised by that. I think maybe one wrinkle was that um, in addition to putting a pause on the issuance of new leases, uh, the president also put a temporary pause on the issuance of new drilling permits, but again, on federal lands only. Um, and that is a small share of total US oil and gas production although it does matter materially in certain states, such as New Mexico, where production on federal lands is half of the state's total production. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some of these changes uh, which have been brought through uh, have been, uh, they've, they've come through through presidential authority, so executive orders and the like. Um, but what type of changes might the administration pursue that would require congressional action? And um, what are the odds of success of those kind of attempts? Right. Well, and that is the uh, trillion dollar question, isn't it, Joe? Um, that's, um, I think, you know, what, what we've seen, you know, from the previous administration, as well as the early days of this administration is the use of executive orders. And that's, um, you know, within something that the president can do himself. Um, but as we've also seen with the change over the administration, it's something that the next president can undo, you know, with the same stroke of a pen. Um, and so it has always been the political reality in the United States that, you know, if, um, you know, that executive orders are perhaps politically expedient, um, but if you want something to really stick, you need to work through the legislative process. Um, and that's, uh, you know, much more difficult um, and time-consuming uh, uh, activity. Now, there are plenty of things the president can do on his own executive authority. Now, would you like, I, I think it might be useful if I can spend a minute reviewing the types of things the president could do on his own executive authority. Yeah, please do. get into the uh, legislation. Sure, go ahead. Great. 
Okay. I mean, I think in addition to um, it being politically expedient, there are a lot of things that are within the president's um, executive authority through the regulatory uh, process. So um, I think it um, would not be surprising if we saw a ban on new leases uh, issued on federal lands. Um, but again, that was something the industry anticipated. And there have been a lots, lots of reports of how industry players stockpiled leases on federal lands in anticipation of uh, you know such a ban, um, and so many analysts feel that you know as a whole the the American oil and gas industry has a sufficient a inventory of already issued leases to be able to sustain its operations for uh, an extended period, including you know could be years. Um, we're also likely to see a process that is more rigorous and slower uh, for issuing drilling permits as separate from leasing permits on those same federal lands and more broadly, uh, using the president's authority um, to regulate uh, under the Clean Air Act, for example. Um, they can put uh, stricter regulations on methane emissions. Um, and other volatile compounds that are, you know, part of uh, drilling activities, for example, uh, as well as potentially processed water. Um, so, you know, stricter review uh, will slow the issuance of new permits. And by the way, um, similarly for the whole energy value chain, including uh, pipelines, et cetera. Um, uh, we're also seeing, uh, you know, the president very famously uh, revoked the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. Now that pipeline had been permitted and was under construction, but was not actually in operation. Um, there are also uh, court cases um, and regulatory uh, proceedings around other pipelines um, that that are in operation and uh, oil pipelines in particular. Um, you know that could have impacts on existing production and transportation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is talk about the Interior Department doing a review of royalty rates on federal lands, um, you know, which in onshore haven't been adjusted in many decades. Um, I, I have to say, I'm not sure if the federal government, if the executive has the authority to raise royalty rates. Um, I believe that they are set by Congress. Financial matters are the purview of Congress. So that may take financial uh, uh, or co uh, congressional legislation. Other regulatory actions could include um, uh, a review of biofuels, fuel efficiency standards, um, and ancillary things that will impact the energy sector. For example, uh, requiring the financial sector to much more rigorously assess climate risks in its lending practices, uh, et cetera. So that's um, a review of the kinds of things um, that the president can do under his purview and without legislative action. Mm -hmm. Oh, one final item, Joe. Um, there's also foreign policy, uh, which of course will matter hugely. Um, you know, we've seen, for example, uh, the administration has announced its intention uh, to get tougher on uh, Russia. We've seen some new sanctions issued on individuals there. Um, there's a lot of talk about whether uh, this administration will re-engage with Iran over the JCPOA uh, agreement, you know, the Iran nuclear deal, and whether Iran uh, will at some point um, you know, have sanctions lifted to allow it to export more oil. Um, the Secretary of State has said that that's likely to be a long haul. There's also prospects for uh, you know, there's ongoing U.S. sanctions against Venezuela. Uh, the administration says it wants to find a way to ease the suffering of the Venezuelan people, but I'm not sure how that plays into you know the oil and financial sanctions uh, that are in place. So there's it's important to recognize that there is a foreign policy dimension uh, to a lot of these decisions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've got a few uh, questions on my list about foreign policy bef before we get to that. Um, so we're talking about U.S. energy policy at home. Um, you know, there's the administration, there's Congress, there's also the the local, the state level. Um, to what extent does that local state level have the ability to push back against um, mm -hmm. orders from above or policy from above? Right. Um, 
Very good question, Joe. Um, and I think it's important for people to recognize that policymaking in the United States is very diffused um, and that there is significant authority for state and even local officials uh, to intervene in uh, these matters uh, that, that impact energy, I think to a degree that is unusual around the world. Um, and so we have seen, for example, a number of state attorney generals uh, challenging already some of the Biden administration's executive orders. Um, you know, individual states have authority to set um, priorities within their own uh, borders. You know, a couple of years ago, there were board, you know, initiatives uh, on the ballot in several uh, energy producing states to change the rules for where uh, drilling activity would be allowed and how much setback, for example, is needed from roads. A number of communities are implementing policies to effectively ban the use of natural gas in residences, uh, you know, and to you know, uh, convert uh, heaters and um, um, you know cooking items to uh, electricity instead uh, as a way to reduce uh, CO2 emissions and methane uh, flaring as well. So a lot of this policymaking uh, will happen at the state and local level, and that is uh, independent in some ways of, uh, who's sitting in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Mm -hmm. So moving on to energy and foreign policy. Um, so you mentioned the, um, Keystone XL pipeline. Um, you know, can I, Canada expressed its, mm -hmm. it, it, the fact that it disagreed with the, um, the move, uh, to, to block the pipeline. Um, so my question is what, to what extent does climate policy, climate considerations trump all other policy decisions overseas? Um, uh, we, will, we will see. Um, <laughs> I think, I think yeah. you make a very good point, Joe, which is that I think um, a lot of the policy uh, that we've talked about already, both foreign and domestic policy, is should be viewed through the lens of climate. Climate uh, policy is one of the big organizational thrusts uh, of the Biden administration and of Democrats on Capitol Hill. Um, and so, you know, and it's not only about climate action, but about, you know, ec social equity uh, and jobs, you know, being viewed through the climate lens. So, so climate will have an impact on the execution of domestic policy, of trade policy, of foreign policy, of labor policy. Um, and so, you know, there's questions about climate change and climate justice uh, and equity are going to be enduring and deeply embedded themes in everything that you know this administration will be seeking to do, at least based so far on their uh, uh, statements. Mm -hmm. um, with that in mind, um, if we look back at the Trump administration, uh, it, it was in many ways very supportive of US LNG exports. It wanted to, it wanted the U.S. to emerge as this, you know, global energy power, um, which of course it is. Um, and you had, uh, especially in Europe, you had U.S. officials touring places like Port Portugal, um, Montenegro, even Belarus, um, uh, talking about prospects for U.S. gas supply, um, and you know the 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 ability of U.S. gas to help uh, reduce countries' reliance on Russian. Russian gas, Russian supplies. Um, so can we say that kind of US policy uh, kind of ended with the Trump administration? Too soon to tell. Um, I mean, it's important to remember that, you know, the initial uh, moves to streamline the permitting of LNG export facilities actually began under the Obama administration. Uh, and again, part of the stated rationale was climate. Uh, you know, policy to help um, reduce the use of, for example, coal in other parts of the world by supplying instead uh, natural gas, uh, which has a you know uh, you know fewer CO two emissions. Um, I think you know there's going to be uh, tensions on both sides of some of those transactions. Uh, however, you know we see, for example, um, in Europe, uh, I've seen uh, you know. Permits to import U.S. LNG have been denied in France uh, over mm -hmm. the concern about the methane, the related methane uh, 
flaring uh, and, and associated CO2 foot or greenhouse gas footprint of U.S. natural gas production. Um, you know, with the, with you know high levels of natural gas being flared, for example, in uh, the Permian Basin, um, and so you know while the U.S. Um, may find that it continues to advocate for export of natural gas under the umbrella of climate policy, um, I think you know efforts to uh, reduce flaring of natural gas uh, and venting of methane uh, could actually support that in a way. But we'll have to see how this administration prioritizes the, um, the trade dimension of that uh, and looks at CO2 and methane emissions in, in the broader scope of uh, trade and foreign policy. And I guess it also falls down to the companies themselves, the LNG exporters, to uh, try and try and overcome that that problem with customers. So we've had a few US LNG exporters announcing net zero pledges, uh, you know, plans to build you know, carbon capture and storage and, and, and other things. Oh, that's right. And I think that's a, a great point to, you know, the United States um, energy producers and energy policy doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there's a global marketplace and a global, um, you know, political groundswell to uh, take more aggressive actions to deal with the challenge of greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Um, and there's also, as we saw in 2020, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, these, the, you know, these energy markets are, are globalized. And so, you know, one of the reasons why um, the U.S. industry suffered is because the global markets for those products uh, declined last year, as well as uh, domestic demand suffering because of the COVID-related uh, economic shutdowns. And so one of the questions is how do, one of the questions is how does U.S. policy provide incentives for U.S. energy exports or not? Uh, but another question is what's the global marketplace uh, and where do U.S. producers fit on a, uh, if you will, a, where do they fit on the global supply curve and how do they compete? Mm-hmm. Um, now, of course, uh, last week you had in the press, um, Biden said in, in, in an interview, he described uh, Putin as a, a killer, which um, prompted quite a reaction over here. Um, uh, I'm sure. It remains to be seen whether that will set the tone for US policy towards Russia um, or not. Um, but can we expect... Uh, further U.S. sanctions against Russia in the future? Do you think that's a possibility? Again, it's not, it, 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 it's, it's not a, it's difficult to predict these things, but. Um, um, I, I think that's a reasonable expectation, although the exact form of it is very uncertain. I mean, I think both um, this administration and Democrats in the Congress, and remember the Democrats now uh, control both the House of Representatives and the Senate, you know, have made clear that they uh, want to continue to uh, investigate and find ways to, um, you know, sanction um, activities that, uh, you know, allegations, for example, of Russian interference in, in the U.S. elections. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think you will, are very likely to see continued efforts to investigate uh, and to uh, sanction uh, you know, people on, on that basis, uh, for example. Um, we also saw, uh, you know, the American um, government, you know, in recent weeks has sought to continue its, um, you know, efforts to influence the, uh, for example, the Nord Stream, uh, it's two, right, the pipeline. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, these, of course, these are ongoing um, efforts. And it's not just, you know, uh, with Russia. I mean, we've also seen the administration has put a pause on arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, you know, we saw some very tense uh, public dimensions of uh, the, the first big meeting between U.S. and Chinese um, diplomats last week, um, and so I think that there is, um, you know, a lot, a lot to watch on the foreign policy front as it pertains to uh, energy. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, talking about Nord Stream two, uh, so it's quite a. Uh, interesting position that Biden has found himself in because on the one hand there is quite a lot of um, 
Democrat and Republican support for getting tough with Russia in the energy sphere and with regards to this pipeline. Um, but on the other hand, I suppose Biden is very anxious to um, maintain and to an extent repair relations with the US's uh, European allies, Germany in particular. So they, they, they have a reason to, to tread carefully when it comes to this pipeline, which, uh, you know, enjoys support from Germany. Um, what is what is the Biden administration likely to do in this situation? I am I'm afraid, Joe, that that's getting very quickly out of my area of expertise, <laughs> and so I, okay. I I would only be speculating. And so I think we that's definitely in the category of uh, wait and watch. And you know the results, as you say, will kind of give us a sense of the administration's priorities about rebuilding late relations with its allies. It's you know intention to hold. Uh, people accountable in Russia for perceived interference in the U.S. elections, um, energy, jobs, and climate policy. These are all uh, priorities that are being juggled, and we will see by yeah. the decisions made how those priorities get sorted and revealed. And have we seen any uh, early signals about how the Biden administration will, um, uh, what position it will take with, with Iran and Venezuela? Um, again, you know, yeah. You know, both both energy states in their own right. Right. Um, I I think the administration has been very clear that it wants to reengage with Iran under the JCPOA. Um, you know, but that it believes that that's likely to be a uh, long and drawn out process. Um, you know, the administration, the previous administration, uh, thought that that was a bad deal that didn't properly uh, or sufficiently incentivize or pressure Iran uh, on the nuclear question. Whereas uh, I think the, you know, the JCPOA of which, you know, was uh, a byproduct of the Obama administration of which, of course, President Biden was a, uh, a central part as were uh, uh, at the time, uh, Secretary Kerry, who's now back in the administration as a climate advisor. I mean, these these were their policies. Um, and so I think there's an interest to get back into the JCPOA as the vehicle to build an international consensus uh, to contain Iran's nuclear ambitions. Um, how that plays out will depend not only on the negotiating premise or, or uh, perspective in Washington, but also in Tehran, as well as the allied, uh, the other participants to the JCPOE capital so. okay um anything more to add about uh, the u.s domestic front well i think again there's been some proposed legislation that um has the potential to um uh, have the implications i would argue of the the implications for the oil and gas industry of the executive orders that have been promulgated so far has been relatively minimal, in, at least for short-term market implications. Um, but the prospect for much more significant action on, on the, um, both on the reg regulatory side and on the uh, legislative side um, bears very close scrutiny. Um, yeah, there are already proposals um, in, in legislation to significantly elevate the, uh, for example, the, uh, the cost of uh, managing the environmental impacts uh, of, of drilling operations and, uh, and the energy value chain in the United States. Um, if those items pass um, in Congress, you know, it could have much more significant implications for the competitiveness of U.S. industry uh, in the global perspective. Um, however, it's important to note that the Democratic majorities in both the House and the Senate are tenuous. Um, you know, I mean, in the Senate, it's literally a 50-50 split with Vice President Harris having the tie-breaking vote. But there are a number of Democratic representatives and senators from energy-producing states. Um, and that is a significant complicating factor. Uh, you know, famously, uh, Senator Manchin from West Virginia now chairs the Senate Energy Committee, uh, you know, is a Democrat from a state that voted uh, in the presidential election for President Trump. Um, and so the Democrats cannot pass legislation um, unless they have the Senate uh, or the energy state Democrats on side. 
And so that has the potential to be um, a significant constraint on the Democratic majority's ability to pass more aggressive uh, legislation targeting the energy sector. Mm -hmm. I think the final point is that yeah. um, my sense is that President Biden you know, spent famously decades in the U.S. Senate, sees himself as a, um, a politician who's willing to engage with the other side and to seek bipartisan solution to big issues like climate change. Um, however, I'm, you know, is there an appetite for such action in Congress? You know, given the highly partisan and politicized nature of decision making, um, and that's, by the way, true of both Republicans and progressive Democrats. Um, mm -hmm. And the risk, I think, is that congressional gridlock could be um, could force the president to take more aggressive unilateral actions using his executive authorities than he has at least uh, articulated to date. But again, as you said, while those executive orders are you know, quick to to make. They're also quite quick to to re just as quick to reverse with a new administration. They are, uh, but you know, four years is a long time for you know energy uh, companies, uh, and so it's and and you know, there's also the matter of these executive orders um, being challenged in 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 the legal system as well. A third branch of the American. Uh, policymaking system that we haven't really talked a lot about yet, but um, you know the, um, for example, um, a relatively conservative majority on the Supreme Court. You know how might that that uh, dynamic play into legal challenges to the uh, to, to some of these more aggressive uh, policies. Well, it's been a very interesting discussion, Mark. And uh, to everyone else, this has been another episode of In a Nutshell, the fortnightly web webinar hosted by Natural Gas World, where we look at the global news and trends in the gas industry. Thank you, everyone, and see you next time. <laughs>